All right, glad to see all of you, and uh, every love you've come in since I sat down. We're glad you've come in. We're glad to see you. And I'm glad to see these, I think they're 10 from Oak Grove. Uh, I've got a, quite a connection to these people. Uh, my first full-time preaching work was in Atmore, Alabama. And the Oak Grove Church came out of the Atmore Church. And uh, two of them here, uh, both of them berries, uh, were little boys when I was preaching in Atmore. And uh, I'm proud of them. They've done really well. And uh, those are happy days. And ever since then, all along, I'm back down with the Oak Grove people. They're special to me and always will be as long as I live. And if the Lord wills, uh, January the 8th, I hope to start a meeting with them. I don't know how long the Lord's going to let me do this, but uh, if he's willing, I hope to be with them. I really look forward to that. Glad all of you are here, though. The local people, you mean a lot to me, too. I've been, as I said yesterday, been coming down to Andalusia now for over 20 years, and good to be here again. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 15. That'll be your first passage to look at tonight. And uh, I hope that uh, I can make my points clear that all of you will understand. And if afterward you have any questions about it, as uh, Ben said yesterday, I'll be glad to talk to you. Talk, and, and, I, and I promise you, uh, I would talk with you just as I would want you to talk with me if, uh, if we were to uh, exchange shoes, as it were. And uh, so don't hesitate if we can ever talk about anything related to the Scriptures. Well, I'm talking tonight about uh, overcoming subjective thinking. And uh, let me just say at the beginning, I don't know about you, but I don't use the word subjective every day. Uh, I think most of us probably have a pretty good idea of what it is. But uh, one verse might help us, and that's Proverbs 14, verse 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Subjective thinking is injecting into what God teaches what seems right to us. Uh, back when Robert Turner was living, he was one of my favorite preachers, and he had this little illustration. He said the subjective thinkers have to filter everything through their own intelligence, their own experience, their own emotion. If it filters through, they accept it. If it doesn't filter through, they reject it. So that they go through the Bible, accepting this, rejecting this, or oh, I love this, all depending on what it agree, whether it agrees with their thinking or not. That helps us, I hope, to understand subjective thinking. But to help us even more clearly, let's look at some examples. And that's why I had you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is Saul, who uh, was guilty of some very subjective type of thinking. Look at verse 1, beginning in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over the people over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek. Utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare, but kill man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That made no sense to Saul. Why would I kill all the ox and sheep when I could bring them back and have the greatest sacrifice ever had since the beginning of sacrifices. And why can't he kill King Agag when he would make a wonderful trophy of our victory over the Amalekites? It makes no sense to Saul. So Saul does what he thinks makes sense to him. That's subjective thinking. And of course, God appeared to Samuel 
told him that Saul had spared the sheep and oxen and King Agag. And so Samuel went out to meet Saul. And it's an interesting thing what was said. Look at verse uh, 13. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He hadn't done the commandment of the Lord. He had done what he thought was right. Well, Samuel talked to him some more. Now look at verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. That's rather typical of subjective thinkers. They're just sure that they've obeyed the Lord when really they have been guilty of doing what they thought was right. There's an old illustration. I wonder if all of you haven't heard it, uh, but it's worth telling again of a father who leaves for a year. He says to his son, son, there's some things I need you to do while I'm gone. I want you to build a barn over here. I want you to build a smokehouse over here. Anybody know what a smokehouse is? And uh, I want you to dig a well over here. And the son builds the barn right where dad said. The son builds the smokehouse right where dad said. But when the time came time to dig the well, he said, I don't know why dad wanted the well over here. The well needs to be closer to the house. So he digs the well where he thinks the well ought to be. Has he been obedient to his father? He never has obeyed his father. Why did he build the barn where he did? Because his thinking agreed with his father. Why did he build the smokehouse where he did? His thinking agreed with his father. And the first time that in his own subjective thinking he dis disagreed with his father, he did what he thought ought to be done. Do we see the problem? Let's go to another one. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. This is the account of Naaman. Naaman was a great man. In fact, look at verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because he... By him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Here, apparently, would be second in authority in all the nation of Syria. I would think he would be second to the king, but he got leprosy. But he learned through a Israelite girl that he had captured out of the land of Israel, about a prophet in Israel that could cure him. Well, eventually he got to the prophet. Now, let's begin reading there about verse uh, 9. Then Samuel went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you should be clean. Can you picture this? Here's a man of great power and influence, and he's riding up to Elisha's house, and he's in his chariot. And later in the chapter, we're told he has gold and silver and changes of raiment. I mean, this is a big man, and he's coming for Elisha to cure him of his leprosy. Elisha doesn't even go out to him. Doesn't even give him the honor of going out to his presence. Just sends a messenger. Go wash seven times in the Jordan and you'll be healed. Well, Naaman is angry. He has an appeal to his pride and the very idea of him having to go to the Jordan and wash seven times. Listen to him. Look at verse 11. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, Do you see this subjective thinking coming through? I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned 
and went away in a rage. It didn't happen as he thought it ought to happen. And he almost went home to die a leper, a victim of his own subjective thinking. It just didn't happen like he thought it would happen. His servants appealed to him. If the prophet had told you to do some big thing, wouldn't you have done it? Why not rather go down and wash and be clean? And he went down, washed seven times. His flesh came back as the flesh of a newborn child. But the danger of subjective thinking. Now, I want to go on the other side of this coin. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> and now we're uh, looking at Simon Peter. And let's see how he reacts in a situation. Look at verse 1 of Luke chapter 5. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let out the nets. Jesus said, let out your nets for a catch. It made no sense to Peter. They'd been fishing all night. They're weary. They're tired. It's time to go home. They've already washed their nets. You can just see all that filtering through Peter's mind. Well, that makes no sense. Then he remembers who said it. Jesus said it. At your word, we'll let out the nets. So that remembering who is talking and what is being said trumps his own subjective thinking. That's what we must do. Do you ever have subjective thoughts? I do. Do you ever look at the scriptures and think, I wonder, wonder why that? Or, but let's always let the word of God top any kind of subjective thought that we might have. Well, subjective thinkers basically fall into two classes. One class is those who want God, they want to be religious, but they want God on their own terms. Somebody may be thinking, well, that, that sounds harsh. Well, those are not my, my words. They're from a newspaper article that was written way back and around the turn of the century telling about what religion is going to be like or Christianity is going to be like in the 21st century. Well, here's what the newspaper article says. For one thing, the move toward cafeteria Christianity that appeared at the end of the 20th century, believers picking and choosing what appeals to them is likely to gather steam in the 21st. You ever heard the expression Christ, cafeteria Christianity? Uh, you know how it is when you go through a cafeteria? Yeah, I'll, I'll take some of this. Yes. No, I don't want any of this. Yeah, I'll take some of this. Well, that's, that's Brussels sprouts. I don't want any of that. <laughs> Picking and choosing. That's kind of like that filtering through illustration, isn't it? And so you have the people going through the Bible and they're picking and choosing. Do you want this? Yeah, I want this. Do you want this? No, I don't want any of that. I don't like that. Yes, I like this. And so picking and choosing, again, depending on what appeals to them. Then this is a further statement in the article. In other words, what you believe matters less than ever. 
This phenomenon is especially prevalent among the baby boomer generation, the 76 million Americans who began turning 50 in 1996 and start looking for God, but their own terms. That, that's, that's an expression out of the paper. So you have some who are subjective in their thinking and they're always looking for God, but they want God on their own terms. So if you ask uh, these people, well, what kind of church are you looking for? Well, they might say, well, uh, we would like a church that uh, has a lot of recreation for the young people and a lot of good activities for the senior citizens and a church that is concerned for illiteracy and poverty and disease and doing things to correct all of that. And Well, what kind of worship periods do you like? Oh, I love a preacher that's entertaining. He just keeps us all just laughing, and, uh, and, and we get to emotional highs. And You know what we ought to do? Pick up our Bibles. Search the Bible for what God wants the local church to be. And then find a local church that agrees with what the Bible teaches. But when we're subjective thinkers, we're more interested in what appeals to us than what God describes in his word. Now, the second class of people who are subjective thinkers are people who are just sure, and they're genuine and sincere, but they're just sure that God is speaking to them apart from the scriptures. They would probably say, uh, what you're calling subjective thinking is really the Holy Spirit speaking to me. But suppose we grant that. One problem that arises with that is how do you distinguish between your own subjective thinking and what the Holy Spirit is saying to you? Do you have subjective thoughts? I would think so. That's all right. But suppose the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, how do you separate your own subjective thinking with that which you're confident the Holy Spirit is saying to you? Now, I have a book called Is That You, Lord? It's written by a man named Gary E. Gilly. And Gilly is an evangelical who is challenging his fellow evangelicals along this very same line. He believes that God speaks to us out of his word and that this is how we learn rather than some subjective or Holy Spirit speaking something into our ears, teaching us something other than what's in the scriptures. And he raises the question in his book, how do you know the difference between your own subjective thinking and what the Holy Spirit is revealing, even if we grant that the Holy Spirit may be teaching you this? And he makes quotes, and they're interesting quotes, from some of his fellow evangelicals defending this and admitting the problem. This is from Dennis and Rita Bennett. We're not expected to accept every word spoken through the gifts of utterance, but we're only to accept what is quickened to us by the Holy Spirit and is in agreement with the Bible. One manifestation may be 75% God, but 25% the person's own thoughts. We must discern between the two. It's an admission that we struggle with that. Here's one from Wayne Gruden. Did the revelation seem like something from the Holy Spirit? Did it seem to be similar to other experiences of the Holy Spirit, which he had known previously in worship? Beyond this, it is difficult to specify much further, except to say that over time, a congregation would probably become more adept at making evaluations and become more adept at recognizing a genuine revelation from the Holy Spirit and distinguishing it from their own thought. There's the problem. And they recognize the problem and recognize, well, it's difficult, but maybe we... We get more and more adept at being able to separate these two. Now, let me raise this question. How is it that we have people all over the place, and you know this, 
who believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, they're going in a hundred different directions in religion. I'll tell you where I really ran into that. I spent three years in Australia, got uh, to studying with some German-speaking people. They spoke English, but they liked to worship in German. We mentioned some of these in our supper tonight. And they asked me to come and speak for them. And uh, my title was, How to Establish a New Testament Church by New Testament Teaching. When it was all over, here came a bunch of them up, you know how we were wont to do. And uh, two of them were the main spokesmen. One of them said, would you allow somebody to preach for your church that had never been baptized? That was his wording. I said, well, no. The Bible teaches baptism. He said, but you see, the Holy Spirit told me I did not need to be baptized. Well, the other was standing right by him. He said, well, the Holy Spirit told me I needed to be baptized. I said, well, wait a minute. One of you says the Holy Spirit said not to be baptized. The other says the Holy Spirit said to be baptized. I know this book is the product of the Holy Spirit. And it teaches baptism. Do you, do you see how we always have to get back to the Scriptures? And are you aware how often in the Scriptures we tend to say, and I do too, and I wouldn't be surprised if my friend Ben does the same thing. Paul said, or Peter said, or James said. But oftentimes those writers of Scripture would say, the Holy Spirit said. Turn to Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture has to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke. Before, by the mouth of, who spoke? The Holy Spirit did. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes from Psalm 95, and there are many other of those, the Holy Spirit said, let me tell you, every time you read anything out of the Scriptures, you can say the Holy Spirit says. You know that's from the Holy Spirit. But when it's something that you really can't sort out, whether it's my own uh, subjective thinking or maybe something, maybe the Holy Spirit said this, there's an admission that we can't be sure so the Holy Spirit says. So we have the Scriptures. And the Scriptures are complete. Turn to 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy 3, I'm looking at verses 16 and 17. What about the Scriptures? Well, here's what he said. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What makes us complete? The Scriptures. Makes us complete for what? Every good work. If a thing is a good work, it's going to be authorized by the Scriptures. Anything that's good and we, what we need to know in service to the Lord, you'll find it in the Scriptures. So if we find it in the Scriptures, then we can be sure that what we're teaching and what we're practicing is in keeping with God's will. And that's what all of us want. So there's a challenge that's facing us. As we form our convictions as we determine what we're going to do in service to the Lord, 
Are we going to form those convictions on a careful study of the Word of God? Or are we going to form them on the basis of our own subjective thinking? That's the challenge. Surely we can see the problem of subjective thinking. It's trying to filter through our, infin our finite minds the things of an infinite God. And you can't do that. I also one time lived close to Niagara Falls. You ever seen Niagara Falls? You ever stood on the Canadian side and watched that huge volume of water right there at you pouring over? Can you imagine a person getting out there with a drinking straw trying to get all the waters of, water, of Niagara Falls to somehow go through that drinking straw? Well, of course, you can't do that. I just as soon get the waters or try to get the waters of Niagara Falls to go through a drinking straw as to filter the things of my God through my mind. I can't do that. The things of God overwhelm me. But when I read the scriptures, I know that I'm reading the word of God. I know I'm reading the teaching of the scriptures. It's the reading of the Holy Spirit. I can know that when I read in the scriptures and base my faith on that rather than on my own subjective thinking. So we said a moment ago, we have the scriptures. They're complete. Somebody says, yes, but they may have been complete for those people, but we live 20 centuries later. I'd, I'd, maybe they wouldn't be good enough for us. Turn to the book of Jude. One chapter, just before Revelation. <clears throat> All right, the book of Jude, and look at verse 3. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. What does once for all mean? Once for all time. The scriptures were revealed in a relatively brief time. The New Testament, the Old Testament over a period of about how many years? Uh, quite a number of years. But the New Testament was revealed over maybe 60 years, plus or minus. And that was for all time. Was not God capable back in the first century to give us everything we're going to need in order to have eternal salvation? And what was revealed then was once for all time never to be changed. And there's a simple reason for that. The problem in the 21st century that really is the great problem for men is the same problem that existed in the first century. That sin that will lead us to hell. The solution in the 21st century is the same solution as in the first century. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us from all sin. And what God wants now is the same thing he wanted then. It's an unchanging message for a changing world. And the world has changed. But what God's will is, it's exactly the same that it was back in the first century. Can it be understood? Yes, it can be understood. Ephesians 3, verse 4, Paul said, which I wrote in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, somebody may be thinking, well, but it just doesn't seem fair that all the Christians of the first century received direct guidance of the Holy Spirit, and we don't. 
But all Christians of the first century did not receive direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. There were certain ones chosen, and they received a revelation by the Holy Spirit. All others learned from them. Turn to John 14. Jesus is with his apostles. He is trying to prepare them for his leaving them. He'll be on the cross the next morning. And while he's with his apostles, he said this. Look at verse 25, beginning. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Whom is he talking to? The apostles. He said, I'm not going to trust your memory. I'm sure I'm glad of that. Do your memory, does your memory ever play tricks on you? Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in a Bible class, and a man spoke up over there, and I had known him since he was a boy. Since we were boys, he was my age. He said, I remember something Bill said a long, long time ago. And I cringed. <laughs> what he might think that he remembered I might have said. And he said something. I never remember saying any such thing or cannot imagine ever having said such things. Our memories play tricks on us. Jesus didn't trust their memory. He sent the Holy Spirit to bring to their remembrance those things. Now go to the 16th chapter. It's exactly the same occasion. He's again Paul talking to his apostles. Look at verse 11. And at verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So he tells the apostles, I've got things I wish I could teach you. You can't bear them now. But when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he won't speak on his own authority. When those apostles spoke and wrote, they weren't writing the authority of the Holy Spirit. They were writing whose authority you think. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. They're writing the authority of Jesus Christ. So it's not the Holy Spirit's words so much as it is the Christ's words through the Holy Spirit. Now go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes on those apostles. And they begin to preach to the people who have gathered together, amazed that they were able to speak in tongues and languages. And about 3,000 were converted. Look at verse 41. And as many as gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. You may have a translation that says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Well, now think with me just a minute. If all of them were receiving direct guidance of the Holy Spirit, why would they have to continue in the apostles' teaching? They would all have that. But the apostles were receiving it, and all others were abiding in their teaching. Now I want to take you to one more passage. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Well, I mentioned this passage just a few moments ago. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's start with verse 3. I think we'll be all right to start there. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Well, that makes Paul one who received this direct revelation of the Holy Spirit. He made known to me the mystery. Now then in parenthesis he says, 
as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul, how did you get it? I got it by revelation. It was revealed directly to me. Paul, how can we get it? I wrote it down. And when you read it, you'll be able to understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. But Paul was not alone. Look at the next verse, verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now we know who the people are who received the direct teaching of the Holy Spirit. It was the holy apostles and prophets. How did all other people learn? Learn through them. That's how we learn. Not only did they speak it, as Paul just said, they wrote it down. And we have it in our Bibles. What do we have in our Bibles? We have that which was revealed to those apostles and prophets directly from the Lord by the Holy Spirit. They wrote it down. And when we read it, we are receiving the message of Jesus Christ, which comes through the Holy Spirit to those apostles and prophets. We learn exactly the way the people of the first century learned. Now to Acts 17. In Acts 17, Paul had come to Berea he had been in Thessalonica. The Jews had generally rejected him. A few had accepted. Look at verse 10. Therefore many of, I'm sorry, verse, verse 10, yes. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, as well as men. What did those Jews in Berea do? Paul preached to them. They searched the scriptures. That would be the Old Testament scriptures in this case. They did not inject their own traditions, or their own human wisdom, their own subjective thinking, they searched the Scriptures. And then when they found that what Paul was teaching is what's in the Scriptures, they submitted to it, obeyed it, and they became the believers in Berea. Who are the believers in Andalusia? Who are the believers in whatever city we may come from? It's those who hear the Word Search the scriptures. Do not inject their own subjective thinking or traditions. Simply receive it and bow to it. And in doing so, they're bowing to Jesus Christ who gave the message through the Holy Spirit. Hope I've made my points clear. You sure do look like you listen well. Thank you so much for listening. And, uh, and, and I hope we, get the, we, we can understand that the scriptures give us everything we need and we don't need any subjective thinking somehow guiding us separate from the scriptures. I'm going right back to what I've already talked about in previous sermons. Those people on that day of Pentecost, Acts 2, recognized that what Peter was preaching was true. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. About 3,000 obeyed. That's all we can tell people. That's not my own subjective thinking. That's what our Lord says through the scriptures. Are you in need of that?
Are you in need of the forgiveness that comes through Christ? You can have it by submitting to his will. Thank you for listening, and we'd love to see you respond if you're subject to the invitation. We stand and sing.